events and programming chairperson. So I arrange all of these things. Today we have a panel of five justices, judges, and practitioners who will discuss the next 50 years of Georgia appellate practice. First, we have, uh, to my left, Judge Stephen Dillard. Judge Dillard was appointed to the Court of Appeals of Georgia on November 1, 2010 by Governor Sonny Perdue. On July 31, 2012, he was elected to serve a full six-year term on the court. Prior to his appointment, he was in private practice with James Bates, Pope and Spivey in Macon, Georgia, where he served as chairman of the firm's uh, appellate practice group. A graduate of the Mississippi College School of Law, he received accolades for his appellate work, including the Judge Robert G. Gillespie Outstanding Achievement in Appellate Advocacy Award, as well as the American Jurisprudence Award in Appellate Advocacy. After graduating from law school, Judge Diller joined the Macon firm of Stone and Baxter, where he practiced from 1996 until 2001. In September 2001, he led private practice for a two-year period to serve as a law clerk at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit for Judge Daniel A. Manning. In September 2003, he joined James Bates as of counsel, specializing in appellate practice and complex litigation. Next, we have Justice Keith Blackwell. Justice Blackwell was appointed to the Supreme Court of Georgia on June 25, 2012 by Governor Nathan Deal. Before that, he served as a judge on the Court of Appeals of Georgia, where he was appointed by Governor Sonny Perdue on November 1, 2010. Justice Blackwell began his legal career in the field of appellate practice. Following his graduation from law school, he served as a law clerk to Judge J.L. Edmondson of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. He then practiced law as an associate at Alston & Berg, where he represented clients in criminal and regulatory investigations, consumer class actions, and other complex commercial litigation. Beginning in early 2003, Justice Blackwell served as an assistant district attorney in Cobb County, where he represented the state of Georgia. In late 2005, he joined Parker, Hudson, Rayner, and Dobbs in Atlanta as an associate, and just three years later, he was elected as a partner of the firm. There, he focused his practice on commercial, um, complex commercial litigation. In 2010, Justice Blackwell was appointed as Deputy Special Attorney General to represent the state of Georgia in litigation challenging the constitutionality of federal health care reform legislation. Next we have Mr. Jeffrey Swart. Mr. Swart is a civil litigator with Austin and Burr. With a concentration on complex commercial litigation, he has extensive experience with business tort, contract, accounting malpractice, and other commercial disputes. Aside from his trial work, Jeff is an appellate advocate and has represented clients successfully in a variety of federal and state appellate courts. He served as chief editor of the seventh edition of the Georgia Appellate Practice Handbook. Before joining Alston and Byrd, Mr. Swartz served for two years as a law clerk to Judge Edward E. Carnes of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Our next panelist is Mr. Jim Bonner. He is the senior consulting attorney for the appellate division of the Georgia Public Defender Standards Council. Mr. Bonner received his J.D. from Emory University in 1970. Even before he graduated, he began his legal career specializing in appellate advocacy. As a second-year law student, he began doing post-conviction work with the Legal Assistance for Inmates program through Emory Law. After passing the bar, he continued with the program as a staff attorney, litigating cases in the Old Fifth Circuit, as well as some cases in the Fourth and Sixth. After briefly going into private practice, uh, Mr. Bonner joined the Prisoner Legal Counseling Project through the UGA School of Law. He stayed with that program for 25 years, where he primarily represented prisoners in habeas corpus actions. During that time, he resolved two cases in the United States Supreme Court, where he personally argued two cases. In 1996, Mr. Bonner joined the Indigent, Georgia Indigent Defense Council, where he served as Director of the Appellate Advocacy and Legal Research Division until 2007. And our last panelist is Anna Green Cross. Ms. Cross is the Deputy Chief Assistant District Attorney in charge of capital and complex litigation in the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit. Prior to joining the DeKalb County District Attorney's Office in 2013, Ms. Cross was the head of the appellate unit of the Cobb County District Attorney's Office. 
She began her career in criminal litigation as a Chief Senior Assistant District Attorney in the Fulton County Office of the District Attorney, supervising that county's capital litigation unit and handling complex appeals for almost 10 years. Today's panel will be moderated by uh, Mr. Brandon Bullard. Mr. Bullard is currently an attorney with the Appellate Division of the Georgia Public Defender Standards Council, where he assists with the intern program, designs and instructs statewide trainings on appellate criminal defense, and is an instructor for the Transition into Law Practice Program. After graduating from the U U Emory University School of Law, he began his legal career in the Macon Judicial Circuit Public Defender's Office, where he specialized in post-conviction remedies. After that, he moved to the Paulding Judicial Circuit Public Defender's Office, where he served as their appellate specialist and was responsible for all appellate litigation in that office. And with no further ado, I will uh, pass this to our moderator. Sounds better when Margaret says it than when it shows up on my resume. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay if I just speak? All right, I'm going to hand this back to the panel. Then. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. And I want to see how very excited I am to do this. I am your substitute Scott Key today. Scott was the section chair that called in Fort and Camden County and simply could not be here. So I'm happy to step in. I'm excited to step in. I'm especially excited to ask our first two panelists questions for the first time in my career. <laughs> <laughs> what we'd like to do today is take a few minutes to adhere at the 50th anniversary of our main committee meeting and look forward to where appellate practice might be going between now and the 100 years. I don't know if we're going to see that far out, but hopefully we can get some informative comments and some ideas where we might be headed from here. So I'm going to start with a hot button issue of jurisdiction. Uh, in Judge McFadden's ubiquitous book, I know I have a copy, and he talks about the different types of appellate courts or different types of appellate jurisdiction and arrangements of courts where in where there might be or arrangements of jurisdiction between the Supreme Court of Higher Court of Review and the Court of Appeals. And notes, and I'm going to, if I butcher this, please tell me. Uh, notes that we have a type two, we have a type two appellate jurisdiction where our, court of, our Supreme Court has certiorari jurisdiction over the appellate court, but also has exclusive jurisdiction on other matters. There's a trend, though, to move toward a type three jurisdiction where it's uh, well, there's a trend nationally before type 3 jurisdiction where, search, where the Supreme Court is just a certiorari court. And so what I want to start with is if Georgia were to move more in that direction to limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, what effect would it have on the business of the courts and in practice? Let me speak to uh, how it might potentially affect the business of the courts. First, we need to kind of define what it is we're talking about. And let, let me add a couple of uh, caveats before we get started. First of all, just so everybody here understands, I'm, I'm here uh, at, at, as, a, as an individual. I don't speak for the Supreme Court as an institution. I don't speak for any of my colleagues on the court. Uh, Judge Dillard, similarly, is, is here for himself. does not speak for the Court of Appeals. does not speak for his colleagues there. Uh, and we're not here to propose or endorse any changes uh, to the structure or the procedures of the appellate courts, but just to discuss what may be in, in the, uh, the realm of the possible for discussion at, at some future date. Now, with those caveats, the first thing you've got to understand is what the caseload is in the Georgia Supreme Court uh, that arises from each of the various heads of our appellate jurisdiction. Now, just very quickly, most of you know, we have essentially five classes of jurisdiction at the Supreme Court. The first is our cert jurisdiction, uh, to take cases from the Court of Appeals that uh, are of special gravity and, and deserve review in the Supreme Court. The second is our certified question jurisdiction, certified questions from federal courts, from appellate courts in other states. The third is what the Constitution describes as our exclusive appellate jurisdiction. That would be constitutional questions, our constitutional jurisdiction, as well as our jurisdiction in cases of election contests. The fourth class uh, would be what the Constitution calls our general appellate jurisdiction. 
That would be all the other kind of unusual classes of cases that skip the Court of Appeals and go directly to the Supreme Court. Cases involving title to land, equity cases, cases involving wills, habeas corpus cases, uh, cases involving extraordinary remedies, uh, divorce and alimony cases, uh, and, and cases in which a sentence of death has been or could be imposed. Uh, and then finally, the fifth class is cases where the Court of Appeals has equally divided 6-6, six, six, uh, and so the case is, is transferred uh, to the Supreme Court. So let's understand, first of all, what's in the realm of the possible. Um, the General Assembly, I believe, could shift what is within our general appellate jurisdiction, could shift uh, all or some portion of those cases to the Court of Appeals. Uh, the cert jurisdiction is not going to change. I think it's highly unlikely it would require a constitutional amendment for the certified question jurisdiction to change. Uh, similarly, for the Supreme Court's exclusive appellate jurisdiction to shift to the Court of Appeals. And finally, uh, equal division cases, of course, would, would stay with the Supreme Court or uh, any sort of constitutional amendments. So let's look at what the caseload is. And, and I have the 2013 numbers. Uh, I'm not sure they've even been publicly released yet, so we're going to play a little game here with my fellow panelists. They, don't, they didn't know I was going to do this. <laughs> the three largest classes of cases, I'm going to define each class of cases. Together, these three classes make up for 90%, account for 90% of the 334 opinions the Supreme Court released last year. The first class is granted cert cases. Cases in which the Supreme Court has granted cert to the Court of Appeals to review their decision. The second class we'll call civil appeals. And by that I mean cases that come up as title to land cases directly to the Supreme Court, equity, wills, extraordinary remedies, divorce and alibi. The third class of cases are the murder cases. Both where a life sentence has been imposed or a death sentence has been imposed or could be. I want each of, now together, those three classes account for 90% of the opinions that we put out last year at the, at the Supreme Court. I want each of my fellow panel members to hazard a guess as to what percentage, they should add up to about 90, were grand service, what percentage were the civil appeals categories, and which were murder cases. Why don't we start with Anne? Just hazard a guess. <laughs> just, just hazard a guess, because we need to understand the, the caseload of the Supreme Court and, and where these cases are coming from and how they're getting to the court. So you want to break down the percentage percentage of our opinions last year that were granted certs, percentage that were in the civil appeals category, and percentage that were murder cases. Okay. Um, my own experience being strictly criminal. I'm going to weigh heavy on the murder and say 70% murder, 10% granted certs, and 20% civil case. Okay. Jim? Okay, I think uh, <laughs> I was too busy thinking to prepare the hell is off. No, I, I, I would. My guess would be 40% grain and search, 40% murder, and maybe 10% civil. Jeff? Well, now I've changed my answer because I had to say that I had 40, 40, and 20. <laughs> I tried to get my answer. So I'm going to go 35, 45, civil, and we'll keep uh, 20 for the murder cases. Judge Miller, do I really have to do this? <laughs> this, is, this is a no win for me. Um, I would, I, I will say this, I think it's murder is going to be far and away the, the highest. I think the cert petitions, I would guess, would be about 7 or 8 percent, and then I'd put the rest in civil. That was, that was an imprecise, but pretty good, pretty good estimate. The numbers are these. Last year, 54 percent of our opinions were in murder cases. 21% were in the civil appeals category, and 14% were in granted cert cases. So I could, I could leave that on. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we've got to talk about what's within the realm of possibility. Georgia, I don't think is, I, I don't think we even need to discuss Georgia moving to a pure type three uh, or class three uh, jurisdiction. That would require a number of constitutional amendments. I'm just not even sure that's something that anybody has ever proposed. I think there was a proposal in the Constitution in 1983 it was drafted that came from a Blue Ribbon Commission that the State Bar had put together uh, that pitched to Governor Busby and, and his committee and his commission that was redrafting the Constitution at that time to move what we talked about being the civil appeals categories uh, over to the Court of Appeals. Um, that's actually something that would not require constitutional amendment and actually the General Assembly could, could accomplish that. Um, and, and I think that's all that's been proposed. Perhaps somebody has proposed at some point in the past moving the murder cases that did not involve a sentence of death having been imposed, moving the murder life cases, as we call them, to the Court of Appeals. Um, that is such a substantial portion of our jurisdiction and of our caseload. If that were moved to the Court of Appeals, um, that would substantially rework the work of the Supreme Court and it would impose such a burden on the Court of Appeals. I mean, it would require a number of additional panels, I think, uh, of the Court of Appeals. It would take the summer off of the U.S. Sound <laughs> <laughs> better, better. <laughs> we, we would not. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think the most likely thing, if, if there were going to be any move towards a Type 3 um, in, in that direction, I think it would be to move the civil appeals categories over to uh, the, the Court of Appeals. Now, that would still be a substantial increase of the Court of Appeals uh, workload. Um, perhaps Judge Dillard is, is interested in discussing it. I, I don't have any thoughts as to how they would manage that, whether it would require additional judges or panels, whether it would be better accomplished with additional staff to help the existing judges. Um, that's, that's something that could be debated. But certainly the Court of Appeals would need something more, and, and uh, they would need more resources uh, than they currently have. They're already overworked, quite frankly. Um, and, and so they would need some additional help to do that. How that might change things at the Supreme Court that would, if you move the civil appeals over, last year that would have accounted for, as I said, 21% of our opinions. It would have reduced the number of opinions per justice from about 48 for the year to about 36. So what that means is each justice would be writing about one fewer opinion per month, which means the justices and their staff can spend more time on the opinions that they, they were putting out. And the fact is, we would probably exercise our discretionary jurisdiction to take more cases in the event that our caseload decreased. The cases that we take on cert are typically more complex than the direct appeals we get, so I don't know that there would be a one-for-one -one trade off for every case that uh, we push down to the, to the Court of Appeals, we would take another case. Um, but my guess is, you know, last year we decided 48 granted cert cases. My best guess is, is that if we didn't have the civil appeals category, um, that rather than 50, we might have decided 70, 75 grant cert cases. So uh, it might increase, I, I think the current cert grant rate is somewhere around 8 or 9 percent. We ran about 8 or 9 percent of the cert petitions that are filed with us. I think you might see that go up to 12 or 13 um, percent if, if that change were made. And understand, I'm not proposing or endorsing that change. I'm, I just think that's the, the most likely change that would be on the table if any changes were. Well, let me ask the practitioners, if that kind of change were to come about, if we were to say move, the over to Jeff was particularly here, if we were to say move the Supreme Court civil jurisdiction to the Court of Appeals, how would that change what you're doing? Would it at all, or would it change the approach? I, I don't think it would change anything that I do particularly. And I mean, at least from my perspective, which is, you know, I have no business being in the middle of this table. <laughs> uh, and I hope I'm not practicing at the, at the end of the next 50 years. <laughs> but to me, the principal uh, structural issue in the, in the Georgia appellate system and what I'd be interested in people's thoughts about is that it's, it's not at the Supreme Court, but it's at the Court of Appeals because the, the, it's well known that the Court of Appeals has such a crushing caseload that it's, it's not really susceptible of being a collaborative court. 
and the idea of a the idea of a, of a multiple judge panel is not a complicated one. I mean, the basic idea is that three minds fully engaged on a matter are better than one. I mean, that's a very simple idea. And the, the structural uh, component of the Court of Appeals and combined with the caseload is such that you really don't get that. It's because we're all friends here. What you, what you really get, my impression is, is that you get one mind that's fully engaged and you have two minds that act as sort of a sanity check after an opinion comes out from the from the, the mind that's fully engaged. And you can detect a moral argument sometimes, who's likely to have the opinion and many times be right. And and in uh, not orally argued cases, we know that the cases are pre-assigned to judges and go sort of down downstream. I've wondered many times if there was a way to 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 get a dialogue going, at least on the argued cases. Or that they're presumptively more important at the Court of Appeals, and, and wonder whether that could be accomplished without a legislative change, because there's no legislation that requires the clerk to pre-assign a case to a judge on the panel. And if all the panel, if all the judges came to the uh, to the oral argument, and the presiding judge decided the opinion, uh, decided the assignment after a, a, a preliminary vote, I mean maybe that would. Uh, have a, a more fulsome engagement on at least the presumptively more important cases. So I said too much, but, I, but that's, the, that's the issue that I think that is, um, if you're going to have structural reform in the Court of Appeals, that you want to get at. Because you're not just trying to decide cases, you're trying to decide them right and, and with, the, with the kind of explanation that can be respected by future practitioners. Well, I, I'll just add a little bit of that since we're talking about my court. Um, I, I, I think. Everything we're talking about has to be viewed through the lens of the two-term rule. Um, I don't know that I would, would agree that in every single appeal that I, I would not agree with characterization that you're basically looking at the, the, the full weight of the opinion going on one judge. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily correct. Now, I do think it's fair to say, and this may be going more to his point, that one judge may be spending more time on that case, and some of that may be a result of the two-term rule. I mean, the reality is, is if one judge has a case for four months and I get it on the last day of distress, that is what it is, and that's that's just a function of the two-term rule. So all of this has to be viewed through the lens of the two-term rule. Now, all that said, um, it is true, and that's absolutely right, I've been in the federal system, and when I clerked for Judge Manning, we did it exactly that way. We went to oral argument in the cases were not assigned until after the oral argument. They were divvied up by whoever was the presiding judge. Um, but there, there's a reason why the Court of Appeals, that we do it the way we do it. And the reason we do it is in large part as a result of the two-term rule and as a result of the heavy caseload. Um, we do have informal conferencing. Um, and you know, not every, it, some of it's memo driven, but, but there is, um, there is conferencing and discussions that are going on between judges, between staff, and so, you know, I, I, I think in, in terms of looking at this in the next 50 years, if we were to go to a, uh, where we brought some cases, um, categories of, of, of cases down to the Court of Appeals, we would absolutely have to find a way to deal with that additional caseload. We are, um, right now, it is, um, it is pretty crushing. And what that results in is a lot of triage. Um, I think uh, Rule 36 opinions are going to increase if we don't uh, deal with the, the, the staffing, the labor issues. Our staff attorneys are very talented, but, but they're overworked. Our central staff has been decimated um, because of all the things that have happened with the budget. So um, we would have to have a, 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 a much larger central staff, in my opinion, speaking for me, um, I think we, we would also have to look at the possibility of adding a fourth staff attorney to each chambers. And one of the things that I've also thought about, and this is just my thought, is having a staff attorney assigned to each division that would help um, each of the three chambers on that division kind of share the workload. But I don't even know what that would, would be my solution now to deal with the problem we have now. If we had additional um, cases coming, I think we have to consider the possibility of a new panel. And the problem is, and I hear this from some of the, the, the judges that have since retired from the Court of Appeals, that when we went from 9 to 12, it became much more difficult 
to have the kind of collegiality that you had with nine. And um, I think we are a very collegial board, and, but it really does when it's 12, um, you really have to, to, I think, make an effort. And one of the things that I, I think is crucial for an appellate court is to have that level of collegiality between the judges, even, even when you're not going to. Because when you have those disagreements, it's nice to have that relationship, um, knowing that you know the, the person who's disagreeing with you is not doing so um, in bad faith, and, and they're doing it because. Um, so if you don't have those relationships, your mind tends to wander. So I, I think the question is, could we expand? That's where you have to kind of start considering the possibilities. What do you do? If you get to the point where these cases come down and you have to expand the court, do you, do you go to 15? Um, do you consider, um, one of the things I've, I've heard people discuss, some people have talked about having a more regular panels in different cities, like maybe one in the northern, having a three-judge panel maybe in Gainesville or Rome, one in Macon would be nice. It's in the middle of the state. <laughs> yeah, I'm not just saying that because I'm from Macon. It's in the middle of the state. I, I love coming and visiting y'all in Atlanta. Um, and then, you know, having probably, you know, uh, the bulk of the judges in Atlanta, maybe having one in Savannah, but still being a united court. I would, I would not be in favor at all of the circuit uh, system. I got a little bit of a, an experience with that with the Seventh Circuit with the Illinois law and having to deal with conflicting circuits, and I think that's, that's a nightmare. So I would not, but I mean, I don't know what the solution is. Um, I just know that if, if you, if you're going to start putting, um, if you're going to start bringing additional cases down to the Court of Appeals, I'm not saying I'm for or against it. I, I need to think more about that. But I, you, you will absolutely, I mean, we have a, we have a, 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 a problem enough as it is dealing with the cases that we have. And what I would like to see is to have us have the staffing where we can really um, deal with the case, where we're not triaging cases that shouldn't be triaged. That's, that I think, um, that, that's, that's bad for the litigants, it's bad for the lawyers, and it's bad for Georgia if, if we're having to do that. And, and I think most people in this room understand just how busy our Court of Appeals is. You've probably <clears> heard before that our Court of Appeals on a per judge caseload basis is the busiest intermediate appellate court in the country. But I, I ran some additional numbers. I found these numbers very striking. The number of intermediate appellate judges that a state has as compared to its population. I looked at every state in the country with 5 million or more citizens under the 2010 census. Most of the states with a population of 5 million or more um, have one appellate judge for about every quarter million to 350,000 in population. Georgia has the highest ratio by far. Georgia has one intermediate appellate judge for every 800,000 citizens. Very much an outlier. The only two states that are even close are Virginia and North Carolina, and they have slightly better ratios than, than Georgia does. Um, most states of a comparable population, um, New Jersey has a has slightly less in population than Georgia does. New Jersey has 31 intermediate appellate judges. Remember, we have, we have 12. Uh, Ohio has uh, a few more citizens than we do. Ohio has 69 intermediate appellate judges. I mean, that, that is a real credit to uh, how hardworking uh, and, and efficient our, our Court of Appeals judges are. There's a lot there. <coughs> Let me go down to the end of the table though, and say, going forward, if there were more panels on the Board of Appeals, or if we stationed panels in different parts of the state, uh, how would that change what we did as practitioners? How would we, would we approach the court differently? Would we think differently about how we litigated up out of trial courts? Well, we talked about a geographic kind of disbursement that um, something many other states do is a, a subject matter um, split uh, and a division in, in that way that could keep the whole court a centralized court but have a subject matter jurisdiction split between a civil and non-civil. Uh, that would certainly affect a practitioner. I think there is an efficiency to that idea. Um, if one routinely deals with particular issues, or many issues, um, jurisdiction issues, 
then there's, there's less effort put into keeping up with the day-to-day -day routine um, appeals on those issues. So I think that as a resource um, it is an interesting idea that I wouldn't advocate that and I'm not about it to advocate that. Um, that is something that I think some other states in Tennessee and Alabama um, do. So as a, as a practitioner though who is not in that situation if it were a geographic split as opposed to a subject matter split, um, knowing who the judges I am writing for and advocating to are makes a, a tremendous difference in, in how I approach case. Um, so certainty in that regard is always better than uncertainty. Yeah. Well, you know, I've always kind of wondered why Georgia didn't go to kind of a regional system. Just the entire structure of a court, you know, where you have single appellate, intermediate appellate court, no conflicts necessarily among them. They, they do develop, but I mean, they, they should design uh, not to create them. In fact, uh, conflicting uh, jurisdictions is such an important part of what I would think is an ordinary social jurisdiction. It's interesting to me. We operate. But anyway, going back to it, I think. I've always thought there'd be some advantages with having uh, uh, regional courts, more or less like Florida does. But, uh, you know, we're, again, the city of Savannah, maybe maybe going Columbus. Um, but I think one of the problems that we've got is that our population is so, uh, so skewed to the Atlanta area that, uh, you know, that, that I'm just not sure how much business is generated on a regional basis. Uh, but that would be enough to justify the expense. That's a great right. point. And, and in thinking about panels in other places, you would almost certainly have to, to shift Atlanta cases uh, to, you know, for example, not to Gainesville or Rome and Macon. And you might even have to shift some cases that, that would be in near the Macon area. So, I mean, you have to do, because you're right, I mean, I haven't run the numbers, and Keith probably has, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a numbers guy, I just lost it. Uh, but, but, it, but, I mean, I think it's, you know, my own experience has been the, the, the vast, I mean, significant uh, amount of the appeals that we see are coming out of, of, of the donut, of the Atlanta, what, you know, and that's expanding all the time. So I agree with you, I think that's a great point. I think the one change that practitioners would see on the Court of Appeals if you had panels resident in other cities other than Atlanta, what my gut tells me is, is that you would see oral argument granted more frequently. That would be the most substantial change that you would see as a practitioner. Um, because I, I think then, I, I do think being in Atlanta in the judicial building across from the Capitol is a little bit isolating. Um, and the more judges are out in various communities around Georgia, uh, the more they're face to face with the lawyers who are practicing before the court, I think the more likely they are to probably grant requests for oral argument. I think that would be the most real change you would see if you still had a unified court, but you had panels resident in different parts of the state. Well, and even that is impacted. I mean, the, the, the oral argument request at our court. I mean, all of that, the one thing you have to understand about the Court of Appeals is that almost everything we do is driven by the two-term court, a lot of it, and our docket. And so um, it doesn't always make sense. And when Keith and I first got to the Court of Appeals, both coming from the federal, I mean, we spent many days in, our, in our, each other's chambers going, what in the, why, why do we do it this way? But what you realize is there's a, you know, and I'm not saying I still agree with everything. There are obviously some things I, if I, you know, if I were king, I'd change. But, um, but, but the, the the bottom line is, you know, there is kind of a, I don't know how to say it, maybe a, if you look at it from kind of a Burkean lens, I mean, you see these things build up over time. They, they're not just done randomly. I mean, there is a there's a reason for this tradition, and so. Having been on the court now for years, I look at those things in a different light. When I got on, for example, the J.O., I was like, that's the dumbest thing, J.O., physical precedent, what's that all about? <laughs> and um, I got to tell you, after you know going through my first distress, I was like, that J.O., <laughs> that's all right. Um, so, uh, you know, I, my point is, is, is that, I mean, almost everything we do 
is is driven by, and I'm not knocking the two-term world. Let me be clear about that. I think there's there there's a lot to be said for knowing that when you file an appeal with, with our court, you're going to get a decision within eight months. I mean, uh, that sounds like a long time, but but it's really not. It's 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 quick, and um, I think that I think there's great value in that, and I think I, I would not be in favor at all of, of ever getting rid of the two-term rule. I might be in favor of tweaking it um, <laughs> to address some things uh, if I could. But uh, but but you have to, anything we discuss about the Board of Appeals, it almost always comes back to looking at it through that two-term lens. And, and some of these things may not make sense and didn't make sense to me as a practitioner, and now they do make sense. Um, they're not perfect. Look, it's not an ideal. So we, we don't, at, at the Court of Appeals, we, we live in, 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 in in the world that we live in. It's not an ideal world, um, but I think we're, we're doing a pretty uh, good job with, with the resources we have. Since we're talking about practice, I sort of want to shift gears here and note that the Appellate Practice Act, the collection of statutes and laws that, that we run under, has been relatively static for a while. Are there, from both the jurist standpoint and from the practitioner standpoint, are there things that could stand revision or clarification? clarification? When you have to file a discretionary application and when you have a right of appeal um, is a very big trap for lawyers uh, to fall into. Now, there's been a lot of clarification in the case law over the years, and so if you're familiar with all the case law, um, I, I think you can, you can be pretty comfortable in most circumstances knowing whether you need to file a discretionary application or not. Um, but in some areas, it bears very little resemblance to what the statute actually says. And so if a brand new lawyer came to Georgia or a lawyer was filing their, their first appeal and they sat down and actually read the Appellate Practice Act to figure out whether they needed to file a discretionary application or not, um, I, I think they might fall into a trap by doing that. I think we could, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, perhaps if, if the General Assembly were so inclined, they could bring a little more clarity to uh, some of those provisions about when a discretionary application is uh, required. Like I said, the case law already makes it pretty clear in those circumstances, but you could uh, kind of go back to the code and make the plain terms of the code conform more to what the state of the case law is. Jim, you and I talked about this yesterday. You mentioned that he's, he's hit uh, exactly my, one of my fondest subjects. You know, when you, you, you know, what I wish we had was one form of discretion appeal that place to make the aid. And as it is, you know, of course we've got previous appeals and that's in one section. We've got the prison litigation reform. That's planted, talk about a landmine, that's planted somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a species of appeal that probably shouldn't be, but the, those appeals from the guilty police, which are technically supposed to be uh, they, they, treated as appeals by application, should be. And that's all case law. They're, they're, there's absolutely nothing in the, in the code dealing with that. And they, you know, the, that appellate practice all be in one place. It all be simplified. I think within discretionary appeals, they're probably a category A and category B. The category B appeals being a lot of these pro se things, getting principally habeas corpus, where uh, but people can't put a record together, for example, as they could on an locker appeal or in any of the other forms. But, uh, they all be in one place. You know, they, they uh, uh, I don't know why they're scattered like that. The, the bottom line is there's a lot of landmines out there for people. I, and whenever I would have them, people coming in out of state and wanting to handle an appeal, you know, or involve me, um, I would want to know a lot of things up front about the timing uh, when they were calling me. Um, so I, I think from a very general sense, I think all the sentiments are right here. We, we, it, there needs to be greater clarity. Uh, it needs to be practitioner friendly. We, we don't need to have, um, I, mean, I know the people that are experts in here, we're probably talking wrong practice, they make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I, I did this, yeah, that's right, book. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but I think um, uh, certainly, uh, I think we would, better off if we had much greater clarity. What about the rules of the courts? 
were the things that we could. I was sort of the far end of the table. Sorry, the things that those of us who have to deal with the court rules and apply them on a brief to brief basis that we might want to change or do differently or might just want to complain about. Yeah, I would um, take this off to you. But in, in the lack of more clarity or the, the existence of the landmines that, that we just talked about, um, motions practice has in the appellate um, world, I think, has become much more important. Um, and there are, there's a little pity for someone who steps in one of the landmines. Um, so using the rules and knowing the rules, I think it's more knowing the rules from a practitioner's standpoint, um, to take advantage of uh, when someone um, does step where they shouldn't. In, in criminal cases, it's slightly different you might win on one end and end up losing in the bigger picture, so that's just something that um, that you take into consideration. But the motions practice, you take advantage of the rules that are there, because um, that's that's why they are there. It's especially the court of appeals, um, as we focused on the resource issues. I mean, they they have such a large amount of just mandatory jurisdiction. There's no things that, that they must take um, with very little control over the caseload. So if you can give a reason to dismiss a case that should be dismissed by jurisdiction or other reason, then um, it's definitely, I think, a perfect to We take our jurisdiction seriously. Jim, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jack. Well, thank you, buddy. One of the things that frustrates me, you know, I, I wish the two courts would get together into a common set of rules. I know that, uh, I, I know they have to be different, but, you know, reflecting the internal operation, but formatting and that's, I mean, as long as I've been doing this, I've never tried to break it. I had to go and look and see which one is it right to its margin. <laughs> the comedy that they don't space and all that. Your, your wish may soon come true. Oh, I know, I, I, I was, I, I hear so part of the conversation. We, we are, uh, um, we're in the process of um, revising our rules and uh, I, once again, I can't speak for the, for the, uh, our court, um, where it's it, we're at the beginning stages, we're doing some other things internally that we're revising that will that'll impact how we, we rewrite the rules. But um, I, I can tell you from an aspirational standpoint, my goal is to make the, more, the rules while kind of preserving options for people that are used to the current system, providing greater flexibility um, for practitioners while not necessarily further burdening my colleagues. That's that's the goal. I mean, we don't want to, to tie the hands of, of talented health practitioners who want to be a little more creative with their fonts or um, and make things more readable. I mean, we don't want to penalize people for making briefs um, uh, more readable so, uh, and more entertaining. Uh, so I, I think, I think I hope, uh, I don't have a timetable, but, but, but uh, I hope in the next year or so um, we'll start to see some of the, the rules that I hate, like double spacing of footnotes, double spacing of block quotes. I think those things are silly. I will go out on them. Uh, I don't like those. That is, that is one of the goals I have is to get rid of that. So I can't say it's going to happen, but uh, but I think I might have a few a few cause allies on those things. I, I will add that there is an awareness on both appellate courts. I think of. Uh, the problems that it pose for uh, pose for practitioners, especially only occasional practitioners in the appellate courts, um, to have two very different, in some cases, sets of rules, uh, one for the Court of Appeals, one for the Supreme Court. And uh, I'm not going to predict or guarantee, certainly, that the two courts are going to have a uh, identical set of rules when it comes to brief format and things like that. But I do think there will be discussions between the two courts over the next year or so. Uh, about ways we might try to line our rules up so they're more consistent. I think it's fair to say there's a spirit of cooperation, uh, and we'll, we'll see where that goes. But uh, I think both courts um, are committed to making the rules as um, practitioner friendly as possible. And I think there's, uh, and I know that um, for my court, uh, uh, Chief Judge Phipps and Presiding Judge Dole um, have both, you know, indicated. Um, have given me the charge as rules chairman to, to do that, and so we are going to do that. And, and I will say there, there will there will be some change. I mean, there will be some differences between always, just because of the nature of how the Supreme Court 
uh, operates and, and deals with its cases and how we operate. So that there's always going to be some differences just because of how uh, we operate. We do operate very differently. Uh, so that's, that's going to be reflected in some degree in our rules. Stick a peg in there and note sort of in the crafting of briefs that I think the Supreme Court has gone to mandatory whether that's going to happen in the court of appeals or getting there or not. But as you move forward and forward, or further forward into, into digital practice, I want to ask first, are the jurists on the courts printing out their briefs? Or are they reading them on e-readers? Is there a mix? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tackle that from the court of appeals. Um, we, I think it's it's a mix right now. I mean, obviously, because of the budgetary constraints, we're, we're constantly trying to build up the technology with our court. As, as for what I do with my chambers, um, when I get you get a, a record from the clerk's office on the case that I've been assigned, um, it's going to be a, a paper record. There's going to be volumes, and then the briefs are going to be uh, printed out on top. And then usually by the time I get it, um, you know, I'm going to have uh, maybe a, a rough draft of what the opinion something to put uh, at the beginning of that. But I'm going to basically be dealing with paper. Um, but I do a lot of, once I get the opinion and I start diving into it and doing the research, I'm online a, a great deal. Um, and then when I go to oral arguments, what I typically do is, is download the briefs on my iPad and take those home. It makes it easier than having to lug them back and forth to make it. And then so if any of you appear before me oral arguments, sometimes you'll see my iPad and I'm going through there and I have a PDF program where I can highlight language and even write little you know, remarks and you know notations and this is where I'll ask the question. So um, you know I think it's gonna increase and you know it'll be interesting to see whether the briefs, you know, you have the hyperlinks and where it's embedded and you know and they have the disk and you can actually have the, the video if there's a video deficit. I mean I think it's gonna be interesting to see where all that goes, but do I think we're heading to a time where we're going to have digital records. You know, as a former clerk, I'm very sympathetic. And as a judge who's had to look through records, I'm sympathetic to having that hard. There's something about having that hard copy. I like it. Um, I know we're killing a lot of trees, but I like it. Um, but but I, I do think we're at least going to have, um, I think it's for a while at least we're going to have both. Um, and there's just something about staring at that computer screen for too long. That starts to starts to get to you. So when you wear the trap over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll evolve to the point where we get used to it. I don't know. But um but you know, I, I think uh I you know, I think for the foreseeable future, at least in our court, it's gonna be a mix. I, I, I think it is a mix among the, the judges and justices at, on both courts. Um, you know, I, I saw a news story a couple of days ago that estimated 75, 78 percent of the population now suffers from what they call digital eye strain. I'm not sure if that's any sort of formal diagnosis or not. Um, my own practice is I like to review short filings, for instance, in motions practice. Um, I like to review those on the screen if I can, but if I'm going to be looking at something for a long period of time and dealing with it, uh, a, a brief as I'm preparing for oral argument, um, I'm probably going to print it out uh, and, and look at it on paper. Uh, Judge Dillard mentioned digital records. I mean, one of the issues we have in Georgia is we have 159 counties. We've got all these different clerks, and they do things their own ways in, in the trial courts. Uh, we don't have uh, a truly unified uh, judiciary where, uh, from the top down, you can tell all those clerks and, and all those spirit courts and state courts the way they're going to maintain their records and how they're going to do things. Uh, but I will say on, on the Supreme Court, we are moving towards at least having the capacity to receive digital records from the trial courts that have digitized their records. Now, not all the trial courts have, but some, some do have e-filing or they have paper filing and they digitize everything once it's been filed by scanning it in. Um, I got an update from, from our clerk as of this morning, um, and we are preparing to actually start the kind of internal beta testing of uh, our new system uh, for receiving digital records. As soon as we've tested that, we'll reach out to some trial courts uh, that are digitizing their records, uh, do some testing with them, 
uh, to make sure they can transmit. And it's my expectation that at least by the end of the year, the Supreme Court will have the capability for those trial court clerks that are digitizing their records for them to electronically transmit the records to our court. Well, um, if, if I might, but that would be a huge, I mean, it, it would be, I think it would be personally great if the General Assembly would require all the trial courts to do that and, and appropriate for it. I mean, anybody that practices in the metro Atlanta counties and has cases that, do, that generate records of any size knows that, uh, uh, that as well as good as a, a job as the courts do about a about two-term rule, it's not an eight-month process. Because if you've got a record in, in Fulton County, it can take you a year to get the record copy. And it doesn't matter if your record is a little record, if it, because they take them generally in order. And there's a, there's a line of case law out there that sort of puts you in the death grip of fear of designating less than the entire record because that's likely to be considered against you. So routinely, uh, we don't, in our cases, designate less than the entire uh, record because nobody wants to, uh, you know, be that person that decided to leave something out that you get deemed about. And so it, it, it becomes very difficult to explain to clients why it could be a year before their appeal commences. And if, if, the, if the appellate courts had the capacity to receive and the, court, and the trial courts had the capacity to send the electronic record, then hopefully the General Assembly could find the money that the judge dealt with to print as many copies of the record as he wanted to and have them in the paper. I mean, I think the Court of Appeals ought to have as many printers as they need. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Supreme Court, there is a lot of work 
that goes into that. I recall one case uh, in the past year at the Supreme Court where uh, the final order was one sentence denying review. There was a 50-page single-space memo that was prepared by Justice's Chambers analyzing the issues in the case that circulated around to the other justices recommending that we deny review. Um, so, moving to a, a more discretionary review regime, that's not a panacea for uh, the court's caseload problem. Um, so I, I think the most likely solution is we're going to see a substantially larger Court of Appeals 50 years from now um, and perhaps a restructured one, whether it's along geographic lines, whether it's along subject matter lines, or, or whatever lines you divide it among. Uh, I, I think that would be the biggest difference we'd see. Yeah. I, I don't have anything to add to Justice Blackwell's summary. I think that something's going to change. The, uh, the no state that has a population that's this large we've already seen you know does it this way and it's it's not it's not a path that we can continue on right now to just keep you know adding a judge every few years to the court of appeals and and hope that that's going to work out and you know how it's resolved will be partially a political question <coughs> but, but something will have to give here yeah yeah i'm going to take off on something that judge Hillard said to Justify my being here representing the criminal bar. <laughs> you know, I, I agree entirely that, you know, we try lawyers, and appellate lawyers are different things to cat. Um, the, the particular difficulty that we have on the criminal side right now is that for various reasons, we drive trial lawyers out of the appeals. And it has to do with the ease with which we front load uh, ineffectiveness claims to, to, to the only correct people, which is really changing the subject of the appeal somewhat. But what that means is that, that when that case goes from a trial specialist to an appellate specialist, it's frequently a, an appellate specialist that has had nothing to do with that case, that doesn't know about that case, and that in particular is all <coughs> appellate practice, practitioners. Well, I'm saying it had nothing to do with changing the issues of the case. And instead, we have a case tried by a lawyer who, in the public defender system, is going to be heavily overburdened, comparable to your court. Uh, you know, we just really do the trials too. And uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're driving towards something where bringing an appellate specialist in on the you know, to, to deal with a record like that is not really, we're not executing criminal justice very well. Um, so, you know, if we're leaving 50 years into the future, I hope we've solved that problem. Well, because, I mean, I, I think I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it's one of the reasons why when I was in private practice, I was on the CJA panel for the 11th Circuit, um, because I very much believe it's not just providing you know, uh, not just competent, but, 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 but good representation at the trial level, but in many cases, it's even more important to have the appellate level. Well, well what, what I advocate is, what you really need is, I mean, it's fine to have the different breeds of cat, right. but the appellate lawyer ought to be involved in that oh, I'm with you. early I, on. I absolutely, uh, so, that's so ideal. That those issues can be identified, and, and now we, you know, we have offices that have very good appellate divisions, like the cat public defender's office, George Weimar. Uh, you know, there are many of the cases that office handles that, that, that if he had anything to do with it, he's not going to run into the appeal. Right. You know, it's going to go out. Um, and and it, it's going to go into the hands of a lawyer who, or another appellate lawyer who might not understand, you know, how things were shaped. Might not even see the issues the same way. Yeah, the problem is it's yeah. tough enough to fund them just to handle the appeals. That's where I see the, uh, I agree with you, I mean, in an ideal system, it's tough enough to convince civil lawyers to do that in big cases. Um, and so, but I agree with you, I mean, I, I think you're right, it's very, it's, it's very difficult to handle, um, it, it's much more challenging to handle when people cold when you're going to the trial. Got that off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next two features. Um, I don't think there's much else to add about what structural changes we might see. I think you guys have talked about that. Uh, I think that advocacy, appellate advocacy, will change and become more dynamic than everything else is with the, use, the ease of use of electronic uh, presentations with, with 
audio, video, things like that, I think are more engaging, more accessible, more effective, and I think you'll see a development in that area too. Thank you. Anything from the floor? Um, I live in terror as I write briefs that Judge Dillard likes to use endnotes in his decisions. <laughs> And if I write to Judge Dillard by using endnotes or footnotes, Judge Boggs is going to be mad at me because he can't see the name of the case or the citation and the substance of the brief. Um, it's really Justice Nominees you've got to work on. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably, I, I hear from him frequently, and so I like to tell him he has, he has, he's allowed to review my, the merits of what I write. <laughs> Right There's way. no answer. And does I mean, anybody I mean, hold it against us for doing it one way or the other? I, I don't even think, uh, uh, you know, I, as I like to say about myself, I'm sure Justice Nomics do too. We have tiny hearts, but they're full of compassion. I don't think that you, you have, I really don't think you have to worry about that. I know that, that, that some justices and judges prefer different things, and some do a hybrid. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the, the, the key thing, what I would tell you to do is to, is to, to find your own voice, find your own style, and go with, go with what makes you, and, and write good briefs, and I think if you drop the foot in that, I mean, look, I'm in the minority, there's no question about that, as the reporter's office, I'm sure, would tell you. Um, but, you know, I don't, look, I don't think it, you don't have to live in fear. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> If you ask the 12 court of appeals judges and you ask the seven justices of the Supreme Court about kind of their pet peeves stylistically or typographically, I think you would get 19 very different answers. I mean, one of mine is our rules allow you to write in career font, don't. Right. <laughs> I, I told the, the Attorney General's office was notorious for writing things in career font. The one advantage was. Uh, if I misplace the attorney office brief, <laughs> I see a much bureaucratic looking document on my desk, and there's the attorney general's brief. I, I suggested to General Owens that they experiment with different allowable fonts. I just have to do some headache. So, uh, and, and as a practitioner, the last thing you want associated with the brief is a headache on the part of the judge. But I mean, I, I think we all kind of have our own pet peeves and, and preferences. Just yeah, one thing. We're talking 50 years in the future. I was trying to go back on my phone, and you know, the population of Georgia 50 years ago was about 4 million people. So we're two and a half times the population. I don't think the caseload has gone up two and a half times since then. I'm not sure why, even though we're more litigious. I was trying to figure out where we're going to be in 50 years, but the only thing my phone gives me in 50 years are predictions of the end of the world. <laughs> 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 I mean, I know that there are predictions that will be at least double the size. So 20 million people, you know, and members that Justice Blackwell gave for, you know, 12 judges for 20 million people when Ohio is 68 to 10 now. I mean, something radical is going to change. And, and the technology side of it, I think, also may be radical. You now I'm thinking, you know, holographic oral arguments, right? <laughs> in, my, in my pajamas. And, <laughs>
dealing with the problem, um, you know, that's a bad idea. Uh, I, I think uh, what, what we need to do is there needs to be whatever we do, and I'm not advocating anything, but whatever we do, I think it needs to be comprehensive. I think uh, it needs to be, you know, thought out over a period of time, and quite frankly, I think it needs to start now. Um, and I'm not saying it needs to happen now, but you know, the, the sort of reforms that I think we're looking at are going to require a lot of planning, and there's going to, it's going to, to hit a lot of different areas. And so, you know, I, I completely agree with, with the Jeff that this idea of doing a little bit of a patch here, the, the unfortunate human nature is you wait to the breaking point to actually address a problem. And, and the bad thing about that is, is you're, you don't really have time to, 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 to be a good problem solver when you're under that kind of duress. So you, you do the patchwork problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that in the near future, in the next you know, five years or so, we're going to really start talking seriously about how to address these problems, hopefully before that. And I'm, I'm in a math mood today to throw some numbers back out to uh, Justice Namius's point. I mean, assuming a, a doubling in Georgia's population over the next 50 years, that would put us approximately to where Florida and New York are population-wise today. Um, and Florida has 61 intermediate appellate judges. Uh, New York has 71. And we have 12 right now. That's a lot of potential expansion. Although it does make me feel special. <laughs>